Hey guys, welcome to episode 1 of this How to Play Age of Wonders 3 video series. Um, this video is dedicated just to the main menu and the menus attached to it. We're going to start off on the top of the screen and work our way down. And we'll do right to left on these buttons because I want to show off the options and the, and the graphic settings I'm using ASAP. So, this top left button, this will link you to the game's uh, manual encyclopedia. You don't really ever want to use the Tomb of Wonders from the main menus though. This is for one key reason, so as you can see here, click abilities, it tells you what abilities are. But if you want to see an actual ability, uh, a spell, Age of Deception, this information is only available in game, aka when you're on a map. Um, you do still get quite a lot of features here, if you want to just look at combat spells from, let's say, a warlord, no, I can't show you that, a theocrat. Um, so here's all the theocrat combat spells. So you can still see a lot, but you really want to check it out in game if you're just in for checking out all the, the awesome abilities. We'll do that later. Uh, on the right of the screen, you've got the build, the date, and the time. This is not the right time at all. It's like 1 in the morning for me right now. Whatever. Here you've got your account settings. So profile settings currently just links you to options, but I guess when the game is released it will uh, let you change like your account name or whatever. Logout is the same thing as this button, basically it logs you out from the game and, and, and closes the game. Edit leaders will bring you to the leader creation screen and we'll see that a little bit later. Basically this is a shortcut to just creating a character without being tied to uh, a game. Okay, online multiplayer will send you to the lobby so you can start doing some multiplayer. Uh, I must warn though that I can't do this because I'm behind my university's firewalls or whatever, so I can't port forward. That's a bit of a shame, but they've introduced a new thing on the launcher now where you can use choose different ports. So hopefully I'm going to mess around with that and one of them will be accessible to me. So let's get into the options and check them all out. In four tabs, gameplay, graphics, audio and controls or hotkeys. As you can see here in gameplay, I've lowered uh, the scrolling speed down a little bit so that when we get in game, panning doesn't look uh, mad on the uh, in game. These are all the toggles for your, for your gameplay options. Auto save will create an auto save at the end of every turn. It's really useful for the end of every turn so that you don't have to redo all your actions again if you need to reload that turn. Play movement animation is a uh, overworld map feature. Basically, you tell your army to move to a destination. When this is not clicked, uh, they will instantly appear at the destination. When it's clicked, they will run towards the destination. What's fantastic about having a jack is that you will reveal the fog of war as you move. So basically, your original location will be shrouded by the fog again, and you may have missed some gold or items on the ground, or maybe a sneaky unit hidden in a tree when you don't have this jack, so I recommend always having this jack. Display damage numbers, that is in the battle when you mouse over an enemy unit with one of your own units selected, you'll get a pop-up, how much damage you're going to deal and how much damage you'll take from the counter-attack, if any. Show end turn confirmation, it's got its most use when you are a hotkey player and always pressing enter to end your turns, you don't want to accidentally press enter. Uh, and then end your turn without any control of it. So this is pretty good for not accidentally ending turns. Show confirm army movement events. These are, say you tell your army to move to the other side of the map the next turn. If you don't have this checked, they'll just start moving on that auto path that you've set. With it checked, then you'll get a pop-up saying, do you want me to move or do you want to give me new orders? Um, the tactical combat high camera view Oh yeah, recommend always having this checked. So basically in battle, you pan in around eye level with your units, and when this isn't checked, the camera will stay there at the start of the game. But when checked, you start off at a bird's eye view, it's very tactical, you can see everything that's going on. And pretty much uh, re related to this camera is the tactical combat action camera. And this is only a new feature in the beta, it's uh, solely needed. So basically, um, Whenever a, an enemy unit moves on their turn, your 
camera will pan to them in battle and you lose your orientation, you lose your position, you don't have that view of the battlefield anymore. So it's really easy to get turned around and, and lose units. So I'll keep it turned off for the purpose of the video, uh, but as soon as we get into a battle I'll remember to turn this back on because it's extremely frustrating. So these are the graphic settings I'm using. Everything is set to the maximum, I know a lot of guys want to see the game on its best. And I've not done this video thing before, so hopefully the quality, the, the amazing quality of the game comes across through YouTube. Um, these are all pretty straightforward, I'll go through them extremely quick. You've got three different types of video uh, of display. You've got the type of resolution and refresh rate, you can only change that in the launcher. I set to Ultra, then I started activating these. Um, you can use your uh, Age of Wonders amazing pop-up system to see all these do, if you don't know, out of my sofa them, you can pause the video, check them out. There's the audio options, the only things I've really done here is I've turned master volume down, music way down, so you can hear me in the video, and ambience down, that relates to the uh, the birds chirping on the over map, can be quite frustrating in the video. These are your hotkeys, now basically I only use W, A, S, D to pan the camera, and then I use the mouse for everything else. But everything that you use the mouse for, there is a hotkey for. That's really useful too. Uh, okay. Now, load game. Not a lot going on in here. Just one real feature. That's you can sort by scenarios or just campaigns. I don't have a lot in here. Whenever I complete something, I like to delete it so I don't have to look at it anymore. Um, you'll notice this on a lot of the screens. I'll give you a description of it now, so you don't you're not bewildered later on. Basically, there are sort columns. Click it once, it's sorted alphabetically. Click it again, it's sorted inversely. And you can do that for them all. So, uh, small to big, and then big to small. Yeah, pretty cool. You also got your the name of the save, the leader that you, you're playing as, the turn the current save is on, and the date the save was taken at. And that is also on the continue button. So, basically, this is the last guy I played as. Uh, I made a wee test map for, uh, for one of these videos saying apps worked and things. So it's YouTube guy. This is the name of the save. This is the turn I got to, just one. This is the date and the time. Uh, so I press continue, I'll reload that game. We're going to be doing a new random map for this Let's Play series, so we'll cover this later. New scenarios. Scenarios are so much fun. Basically, they are scripted maps with storylines built into them. And, and events will appear. Again, you can sort these by uh, all the different modifiers. A really great map to play is Taming of the Cat. So first off, the, the only downside to this is you do not see the underground layers uh, or anything else. And also sometimes it can give away a little bit too much. Like for example, we know there's some islands in the water here. We know there's a huge island up here. In this big desert, you know, there's an oasis at the top and bottom, a bit of lava. Kind of takes a wee bit of the exploration feeling out of the game. But you don't see the underground, so it kind of counters. So in the description, you've got the name, a description of the story, and then information. So this is a 3v1 team map for three players. Well, you can have up to three playable characters, and it's a team battle. So they're a lot of fun. If anyone is interested in a scenario let's play, let me know because I'm really up going through some of these awesome stories on video with you guys. Now, I know you've all seen countless campaign splits, but uh, I'll, I'll give you a rundown of what they do and the descriptions so that you're not lost when you get into the game. So you've got two factions in the game, these are the two campaigns that ship with the game. More may come with DLC or expansions depending on how well the game sells. Basically, you've got the Elven Court and the Commonwealth. So the Elven Court, or the Elves, were originally part of the Commonwealth, one of the founding members. They broke off when the humans basically took over. As the Elven Court, you play as the spoiled little princess Sundrin of the renewed High Elves, and you've got to claim your destiny to decide the future of the world. In this picture, this very awesome Lord of the Rings picture, is of the uh, Dark Elves and the High Elves from the previous games doing the mending. Which basically means the leader of both factions did the did the dirty business and had their two children, Sundrin and that dude who dies at the start of the campaign. The Commonwealth, 
do you play as young Edward Elric, a promising dreadnought alchemist and a loyal citizen of the Commonwealth, and you follow your own personal path to glory and conquest? The picture here shows you the land ship, the ultimate dreadnought weapon. It's uh, basically just a huge mm, battleship on land, it's pretty cool. I'm going to click into it and show you guys the intro. Uh, I'm not going to play a campaign, but I want to show you a little bit of the description of the next map. So let's do that now. Uh, the Northern Rebellion, this is Edward's story. The Commonwealth spreads to all known lands, bringing the ideals of a united world where all races live in peace. Yet the Empire's harmony is threatened by rebels who fear its progress. Chief among them are the High Elves, who dream of the bygone age when they rule the world. They inspire dissidents as far north as the land of Briska. In the west, the Commonwealth extends a last offer of peace to the High Elves. Meanwhile, I will restore rightful rule to Briska province. Okay, so basically in this map you can see the two, uh, I guess, superpowers of the game. Um, and you can see it's pretty basic, but the red black color is the territory that the Commonwealth controls. These are the borders. These are contested territories. Um, also note that there's a load of this map that you can't see. This is the same map from Age of Wonders 2 Shadow Magic. A little bit more defined, but basically it's the same. And Age of Wonders 2 uh, Shadow Magic, I think, had 15, maybe 16 races. Something like that, and then there's a couple of extinct races from the previous games. And we've been told these guys may all make a comeback through DLC. And if you know, just above here, uh, you've got the frozen lands that the Frostlings live on, and we know through the backstory that the Commonwealth has advanced so deep into Frosting territory that they captured their capital city. Uh, so yeah, you can imagine they're much more advanced up north. This isn't. All of the empire uh, that you see just here. So DLC will, will expand this. On this campaign, you play this line. You're reading Briska. You play as this not very young alchemist at all, uh, Edward Portsmouth. So a brief down of the screen. You've got that button again, but still doesn't really work all that well. You get the uh, title of the current chapter of the campaign. Be careful with this button, guys, because if you uncheck this and then press next, they're going to start talking to you about the story, whether you have this checked or not. And if you realize, oh, I don't have that checked, and then hit it, you're only going to appear in the storyline wherever it's reached to. So halfway through the story, you're like, oh, I missed what, what you already said. This button skips, brings you straight into the campaign, based on the settings that you've already set down here. Go into a little bit more detail on what these all are later. Alright, so now let's do the random map generator. Oh yeah, it's so much fun. Um, so you all know what these are, but I'll do them real briefly for you. 2 means me and another player, and 8 means me and 7 other players. And you're not limited by map size, so if I want 8 players on a small map, I can do that. Or I can have 2 players on a large map, that's all fine. There are five difficulties in game. They all have really cool icons. So basically, Squire, uh, the descriptions they give, the AI will offer very little resistance, recommended for beginning players. The AI won't go down without a fight, recommended for players that have played strategy games before. Don't know how many times I've seen that description. Um, the AI is a force to be reckoned with, recommended for experienced strategy games. The AI will crush you. Recommended for strategy game veterans, but you're going to get crushed, so it doesn't really matter. Prepare to be destroyed, only for the most elite players. Oh, I love that, okay. Um, in our game, we're going to be doing a team battle, so there's going to be four of us. Uh, we're only going to have one Emperor AI, so we'll set them all to King, that way I only have to make one change. And we'll do a pretty small map. I'll show you the pop-ups for these, it gives you recommendations. So, small maps are for roughly two players, and they last about 35 turns. And the, this recommendation of turn times is based on either the entire game, or just a single faction. So one faction lasts 35 turns, 35 turns later, the next faction gets wiped out, etc. Um, medium maps are recommended for two to four players, on average last 60 turns. 
48 players and on average last 80 turns. And large maps, yeah, you really want quite a amount of players here. I mean, anything less than 5 and you're going to take quite a while, maybe 20 turns just to find somebody. So we'll do a pretty small map so that uh, it's a nice active gameplay. Um, if you've ever played these types of games before, you know what these all are. Random will pick one for you. Land means you'll have no borders, no no ocean around you. Continents will have big land masses separated by huge rivers or lakes or whatever. And islands is just islands within an ocean. So I'll just pick it on uh, continents for now. Again, we've got the random option that will pick one for you. Normal, you start off with just a city and an army, nothing special. On a battle map, you start off with a group of cities and a really powerful army, but do be careful because uh, this army exceeds your income, so you can starve yourself pretty quickly. Empire building, you start off with just a settler and a small army, and there's no cities on the map, so you've got to build everything, you and the other players. It's a lot of fun. And adventure, you start off again with a settler, uh, a pretty decent army, and there's a couple of cities on the map, and a lot of explorable locations. And we set to battle. We're going to advance the mess about with the options. So these have been carried over from that last screen so we don't need to mess around with them anymore. Age of Wonders 3 features not only these two options but some more. Basically you can't set them in the random map generator but you will be able to do it with the map editor. That's not been released yet to the beta testers but that's the promise. So you've got the surface, and then just underneath that you've got the underground, and then just underneath that you have this thing called depths, and you get multiple layers of depths. You go from the surface to the underground, to depths, to depths 1, depths 2, and the more of these you have, the more resource intensive the game's going to be. And this here is the, uh, the guts, the glory of your map generation. I'll go through them all pretty quickly for you. So starting time, you can set, set them randomly, don't start with anything, that way you have to fight to make your uh, position in land. Start with just a settler, which is a caravan that can find a city, or all the different sizes of city, so it goes outpost, then you upgrade to a village, town, city, and finally a metropolis. And um, I'm going to go for an outpost, I wanted this game to start off as if we just settled this land and we're now all trying to buy for control. Uh, starting units, you can have it random, weak, medium, strong, or battle. Again, remember that battle will always exceed your income, so don't starve yourself, expand fast. We're going to start off with weak, because I like to have a very weak army at the start, so all the mines aren't cakewalks. I have to control them myself if I don't want to lose some units, uh, which auto combat will do. Um, Starting distance is how far away from other players you start. I uh, don't want to be too close, don't be too far, uh, just about average. If we set it too far, um, with just four players, basically that guarantees that everyone would be in a corner of the map and then it gives you a clear indication of where everyone is. But average is a little bit more random and someone would be here, the other guy would be here, uh, someone would be here, and this guy would be here all isolated. It's a little bit better. Roads is fun and it's a very important decision you have to make early on. Basically, you think how fast do I want to explore the map and how fast do I want vanguard units at the back of your empire to reach the front. And if they set it to none, that means uh, it makes it a lot more important for building roads and getting your vanguard to the front. If you build roads and your enemy hasn't, you're going to be able to have a much larger army at the front of the conflict. Roman units are the guys that are spawned out of brigand camps and cities that will just explore the world. Um, and coupled with none, this means that they, for example, the assassins that come out of brigands camps will prefer to stay in the woods where they can ambush people. But it also means that with no roads, these guys are going to explore the world a lot slower. They don't have to worry so much about the city halfway across the world encountering you that you've nothing to do with. So I'm going to set it to average, so for no more, no less, typical amount. Treasures is something you also really want to think about, it will set up your game. So treasures includes things like mana, uh, piles of gold, uh, items, 
Uh, there's this thing called a treasure chest, which is basically just a, sort of a random collection of gold and mana. You won't know how much until you pick it up. Maybe a couple other things too. Now, I like to set this to minimum. This is because of the early game scouting, and you don't want it to uh, define the course of the rest of the game. Basically, if you think, I scout really well, and player 2 scouts really poorly, I could have, when you have many uh, treasures, I could have at over a thousand, maybe two thousand gold extra from just picking up all this random uh, loot. So at minimum, it doesn't change the course of the battle too much, but still makes scouting a little bit more valuable. Cities, is how many cities are this on the map? I'm going to send to a few, so that um, losing a city hurts your empire a little bit more. Um, dwellings, in case you don't know what they are, are practically the same as cities, except you have no control over the types of buildings that you build. For example, if you're a dreadnought, you cannot build dreadnought buildings. You can only build that race's specific dwelling buildings. So there's three dwelling races, there's dragons, there is giants, and I think the other one's fairies or something like that, the woodland folk. Um, so in the dragon's peak, you can only build like the dragon nest or whatever, and the gold dragon pearl that lets you build gold wyverns. Um, I'm going to set this to few, because I don't want multiple dragon peaks, which is the most OP uh, unit generator in the game because you want just maybe once, then it's a, it's a point of contest for everyone else. The zone structures, I'll set this to average. I do want a pretty decent end game. Uh, this is basically your mines, your mana nodes, anything that gives you a resource. Um, visit structures, they are your shrines of war and things like that. And a shrine of war is basically the army that visits it whenever it's refreshed will receive an army stealing army stealing, <laughs> life stealing for its next uh, battle, just its next battle, and that kind of really can change the entire course of a game, set this to many, and some guy who really utilizes shrines can destroy a high tier army with useless units, um, I, I don't want to say that that's a bad thing, I just don't want the game to become, I've got to go to the shrine first before I fight this guy, so few means you go to the edges of the map and find these structures. I think that's more worthwhile. And treasure structures are the tombs and the, uh, the the dungeons and things in the map. Enterable locations, you can miss in one stack in to fight the, the residents. I, I want to set this to few. I'm not really fussed on having, you know, 20 tombs and 20 uh, dungeons and all this sort of stuff on the map. I, uh, I don't want 20 different dead kings on my map, you know? Geography, this is uh, really important. You gotta think, well, what type of units will I have? So first of all, no unit likes Arctic. Um, a couple of uh, independent units do, but Frostlings aren't in game, so why would you ever really want a, a, a snowy map, unless it's a story thing? Now, let's say I'm playing goblins, and my friend is going to play as the elves. The goblins love blighted, and they hate temperate. So, being selfish, I'll say, well, let's make loads of blighted and, and no temperate. Because the elves, they love temperate and they hate blighted. Basically, if you're on terrain that you like, your morale will increase. And if you're on terrain you don't like, it'll decrease. Uh, with high morale, you have an increased chance of a critical hit, dealing more damage. And with low morale, you have an increased chance of fumbling the attack, dealing less damage. Mm. So I'm just going to set these back to default. Um, so what kind of map do we want to play as? Well, first of all, I'll go talk about diggable walls and undiggable walls. These are just underground. So if you think, um, undiggable walls are just piles of dirt that units with this ability called tunneling can dig through, and undiggable walls are rock. If you set diggable walls to the maximum and undiggable walls to the minimum, you're going to have your underground almost completely um, excavatable, I guess is a good term. If you invert that, you will have the inverse, and you will have no diggable walls, and hard walls everywhere with some really strong natural borders, uh, and, and obvious choke points. But I like to maximize them both. That way you have very narrow diggable walls throughout your uh, undiggable walls. This way you can 
As a defender, you can dig through the wall and place a watchtower or a, a fort to defend yourself a little bit better. Or as the attacker, you can find some sneaky nooks and crannies into the enemy's empire. It's a lot of fun. I like to maximize water and mountains to, again, add in a lot more natural borders. Uh, now, then from then onwards, it's uh, what type of map do you want? So, I want a pretty lush map. Maybe... Um, Maybe lots of trees. Um, yeah, we'll go for lots of trees. Temperate, that makes sense too. Trop yeah, tropical, that's like forests and stuff, right? Uh, not blighted, no, no, no. Yes, yeah, so we've a nice world, and let's just let's burn. That's also that's fun. Um, yeah, burning, forested, mountainy, waterless world. Okay. Um, so now we are on the character setup. Um, so you can choose your different type of game modes, we'll talk about that first. Uh, on classic turns, it will go from this guy to he'll make, take all his actions. Once he ends his turn, the next guy can take his turn, he does all his actions, ends his turn, and so on and so on, until it gets back to the first guy, and then it repeats. On simultaneous, uh, everyone takes their actions at the same time. Once everyone has ended their turn, the, uh, the next turn starts and then everyone can repeat and it goes on to the end of the game. Also note that if you so wish you can play as multiple characters, you can play as them all if you want, but if you want to play with a friend instead of just control two emperors yourself, it might be better to do classic turns. Um, especially if you're going to do competitive with your friend, you know you can say I'll look away while you do your turn and then you look away when I do mine. So set them all back to king. This guy's going to be an emperor. So we're doing a team game. Um, and before I go on, turn limit will set how many turns you have until the game uh, auto ends. And turn timer is how long each turn is allowed to go on for. So you can say, uh, turn this on uh, you're allowed to play for 60 turns or whatever. For one turn. Um, uh, and then, yeah. So I think I saw self explanatory. It's mainly useful for multiplayer. But it's also good for challenging yourself in single player too, I guess. So we're going to have two factions. You can have up to four, that's the maximum. And then you reset back to um, one. Right click doesn't bring you back down through the list. I think that's worth saying. Um, yeah, okay. So customize uh, your leader selection. Defaults will just give you some random ones. So if we do random, that could be different. Not the same. Um, random will just give you any random leader, uh, randomly created leader sometimes. And customize humans. Uh, this guy is also human. I would customize them both. Customize all means I choose exactly every single leader, either from the list or make a new one. Uh, select humans means I select humans from the list. So that top guy, what was he? Groshak, these are guys all from the list, so if I choose select instead, I will select guys from the list and I won't be able to customize. I only want to make my own character though, so we will continue with that. Tactical combat mode is when you start a battle, do you want to be asked if you want to control it or not? You can say always auto combat, I have no interest in these battles, I just want to play the overworld strategy map. Always ask, I always want to control, uh, or I always want the option to control. And only ask when it's between two human opponents, so not between you and an AI, it, it will be auto-controlled. Let's go through the advanced rules now. So your starting resources is how much money and mana, maybe research to you start the game with. Uh, I just pick standard, I don't want a, a super fast or super slow start. Starting skills is interesting. So let's say you want to start the game in a pretty advanced situation, uh, able to summon some extra stuff straight away and go for a few more. I have to set mine to none just because the starting skills that you get are randomized. And if you don't get the scout and someone else does, that's three turns it takes you to research that scout. That, uh, that's three turns you're behind the enemy on scouting the map and then it ties back again to the, to the treasures hidden around the world and then you're just so much more further behind. So none means you get the option, do I go for the treasure, do I go for a unit or whatever. Maximum number of heroes. You can have up to 20 per faction in the game. So that's 20 times eight. There's quite a few. Uh, I'm going to set mine to just one. That means I will have the option of having two heroes, myself and, uh, and a hero, that can lead an army. 
and then all the other armies are going to be led by just normal units, no hero unit. But I think that makes things a little bit more balanced, it's a lot more fun. Here you can set the, the maximum level a hero can level up to. A level 20 hero is godly, he can destroy dragons and things, so it's not quite OP. Level 10, uh, he'll get killed by a dragon, but he can take on an ogre or whatever. Anything under that is, you're getting uh, quite a bit weaker. Yeah, Map exploration. Uh, if you ever play these types of games, you know there's two types of exploration. There is first time exploration, where you uncover the, the pure darkness, and then after that there's the fog of war. Uh, which is shrouded, so you can just about see the terrain underneath it. If you turn this off, the the world is explored, but fog of war covers everything. Um, city founding is pretty self-explanatory. I must have ways you can pause the video, check them out. Uh, city founding, so you can just build cities from settlers. Yep. So supply. Okay. I think that's just good to go. We'll start checking out character generation now. Um, so I'll start off over here. You start off with the name of the character, the race and the class, and then again you've got the race description and the class description. So it's quite a big one. I didn't know it was so big. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so here you've got all the cla uh, characters that have come with the game. These are pretty much all from the uh, campaigns. So you've got a few of the guys that I've made. There's YouTube guy. This guy I made in that test video, I guess I'll delete him, I don't want him anymore. Um, I typically always delete my leaders, whenever they feel me, I don't need them anymore. So we've got Sir Noms a lot, he, he looks like he wants to eat people, so yeah, I think it's a, a fitting name. And then we have Stoopy Greenleak, oh that icon does not match up, well, that's strange. Uh, Stoopy Greenleak, I think he looks badass, yeah. he's pretty, pretty dopey. Yeah, so you can also sort these by just dreadnoughts, just uh, human dreadnoughts, uh, which is really useful. But one thing I note is uh, we've now got this guy selected. You can't create a new character now, it says edit, but to get back to there, just select one of the custom, one of the pre-made characters, now you can make a new guy. I'm not going to uh, read out the pop-ups for all these classes, that would just take way too long, but I will mouse over them, and you can read the pop-ups if you pause the video. And I will give you a brief breakdown of what they all are. So a Dreadnought is the mechanical class in the game. They build musketeers and they can employ force fields and tanks and that sort of thing. Rogues will hire vagabonds and pretty much nasty guys to backstab and inflict poisons. Um, they also have two interesting high tier units. The Succubus, you can sort of think of that as a vampire. And this uh, ghostly apparition unit which is uh, an elemental almost. The Sorcerer is one of the summoner classes in the game, and you summon Eldritch Horror, I think is our OP unit, and it's just this giant head with tentacles sticking out of it. Oh, it looks like the thing from the Matrix, you know those uh, underground sentinels, I think they're called? The Theocrat is Holy Leader, and you don't have to be a good guy, you can be an unholy leader or a demonic leader too, by setting up your colours uh, to match. So if you choose red as your main colour, maybe you choose uh, the draconian race, then you've got these red uh, lizards with giant red flaming wings, or if you choose black, then you've got black demonic wings. So you don't have to be a good guy to be a theocrat, you can be evil. Uh, so it's fun. Warlord is the, probably the most generic of all the classes, but it's still a lot of fun. Think of it as a guy who's conquered nations, and he's conquered the, the hill tribes, and he's got their key unit, the Force Archer, and he's conquered these ogre guys, and that's where you got the war breed from, so I think that's a lot. Of, that's very interesting. The Arch Druid, oh I don't know if I messed over that, actually. The mice over, if you want, want to read the pop-up. Right. The Arch Druid is the other summoner class in the game, this is the better summoner class. All their supporting spells support summoning. Uh, they've got two really awesome high tier spells. Uh, well, a mid tier and a high tier spell that will summon a unit every single turn during combat for you. You don't keep the unit, they, they run away after battle, but um, they're, they're really OP. Okay. They're, they're great. Um, so I think I'm going to. Hmm, it's between Arch Druid and Sorcerer. Well, I mess over all the creatures, all the races for you too. Only six in the vanilla game. 
You've got orcs, goblins, you've got the dwarves, draconians, which are humanoid dragons, you've got elves, and of course you have humans. It wouldn't be an RPG game without humans. Um, let's see. What places haven't really been played much yet? Um, draconians, okay. We'll play draconians, okay. A draconian sorcerer. Um, uh, there's male, there's female. Um, the female draconian, although looks silly. Oh, we see the dwarf. Or not the dwarf, the orc. I, just, what? I don't like that. It's so manly. Why can't you have a feminine orc woman? Why well, don't all have to be manly? Anyway, uh, so we'll be a, a draconian sorcerer. So specializations have changed from the previous games. You now have only four tiers of uh, magic. Uh, you've got air, you've got earth, fire, and water. And if you select one, you then unlock the mastery level. Uh, and then that, that's as high as it goes. Um, now, first of all, think, how do you want to play the game? Do you want to be a good guy or a bad guy? And this affects your alignment in the game. Basically, even though there's a lot of things that alignment does, what it boils down to is how do you take control of other independent settlements on the map. Um, basically, if you're a good guy, you'll do it peacefully, so you'll either buy the city with gold, or uh, do quests for them, do so many, they'll be like, you're a good guy, let's, let's join you if you help us out. As a bad guy, you, uh, you'll conquer cities with your armies. The problem with conquering, though, even though it might be faster than just buying them, uh, or um, doing all the quests, rather, uh, you have to absorb that city into your empire. And that can take quite a while, but it is faster uh, than doing the quests. But I think we want to be, mm, well, draconians. This woman looks pretty nasty, but we'll be bad guys. Bad guys are fun. I'm never a bad guy, so let's be a bad guy. And we burn the world in this, this burning world. Um, okay, that's pretty good. Um, oh, I don't know if I must over all these for you. Um, maybe we'll be a destruction master and just a fire adept. Okay, so I must them all over. I guess I didn't do that. You can check them out. Yeah. Um, oh, also note that these two do not have an advanced level. You can't be like a master expander. Yeah. Okay. Now this is step two of character customization. And here you get the real nitty gritty. So first of all, I'll show you just how many options you have for just the draconian female. Um, it's different for all uh, races and all gender within that race. Uh, so you've got 10 hairstyles, you've got 21 eyebrows on a draconian female, 12 hair colors, they can't have facial hair, but dwarven women can have facial hair. Oh yeah, uh, 27 eyes. And I forgot to go this way. 19 accessories. And the first thing you want to do when creating your character is set the scene. You gotta think, is your character going to be on the surface or underground? Um, some characters are placed, some races rather, are placed in their preferred terrain. So if you're a dwarf, if it's available, it will rather place you underground. Um, as a draconian, you don't really get any option. Um, you get the lava trains, will probably be spawned in lava. So let's pick something a little bit over ground. Right? We know we'll be on the surface, I think. So these are the colors that uh, that are on the surface. This is this color on the surface. But if we were underground, you can see how that color changes. Basically, pick the, uh, the scene that you think your army will be in the most. And then you've got the most accurate representation of your color. Um, I think I'll be on the surface the most, so I'm going to pick this scene, and then we'll change it later to something a little bit better for a profile picture. Um, now let's select our colors, now we've got our scene. We are a draconian sorcerer, so oh, red is a, is a must. Maybe we'll make that our trim, we'll go for black and red. That seems quite draconian. Maybe white and red? Hmm, very odd. There, I don't think my army will look good in that. Let's see. Well, something magical. I guess blue is a magical color, isn't it? What guy? What co what color scheme would you guys use? How would you do a draconian sorcerer? 
Okay, and then also, I've counted these. There's over 50. And in over 50, I just I stopped counting. It's like, there's no point. Um, I like this one. This is the complete Star Wars one. I think it's the Rebel sign. If you get rid of those two e gizmos, that's just Rebel. So I'm going with, going with that sign. It's my favorite. And um, you can't zoom in with your mouse. And only is one zoom level. Um, so these buttons zoom you in. Also note, if you change your posture, it's really hard to tell. Um, that view. So yeah, okay. Let's choose our head type. So go for the skinny one. Keep it a little bit reptilian. Uh, skin texture. Ooh, that's weird. Um, so there's three options. Uh, I'll go for this. This looks interesting. Okay. Skin color. I really like the green though. It's kind of awesome. There's twelve options. Oh, purple. It's fun. It's your typical draconian color. Let's go for the green. Make a more key. Um, skin decoration. So I think this is the nose. We'll find that now. Oh no, this is your paint. Cool. Um, can't we maybe pick a brighter color and you can see the all the different types a little bit easier. Okay. Um, and these are the same for all the characters really. This is different. Uh, I think on other characters it's stripes. Yeah. I suppose it makes sense for a draconian to have burnt marks, or maybe they'd be resistant to fire. Fire burns, and they do have fire resistance, so maybe they wouldn't get burned. Um, yeah, sure, you can be a bit of a bit of a creepo and have your war paint. Um, okay, oh yeah, I don't like this hair, it's it's odd. Or well, at least horns, rather. First off, let's turn that off. Ooh, you've got a weird head. <laughs> I don't want you to look like a ram. Um, that's interesting. It's sort of like a crown. I'll go for that. Eyebrows. 21 of these bad boys. I'll do this quickly. I think we're already on. Oh, like I'm 40 minutes to just finish this up. The eyes. There's all different options. Ooh, the black ones are awesome. Very supernatural. And accessories. So you want anything at all. Uh, Give you some earrings, me nice. Well, not them. Uh, nice. Um, oh, good God. Yeah, sure. Actually, you know, you look all feminine. Okay. Um, let's pick a more draconian scene. Oh, pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. Let's zoom out and choose our pose. Um, no, no. That's my favorite pose. I love it. Um, oh, good God. Uh, maybe it's kind of weird. Well, we are a sorcerer, so that's sorcerer, isn't it? Oh, that head tilt! Is like, Come at me, bro! Uh, I'll go for that. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, you get to see the belly, the the rimmed belly. Uh, I like the one where they look at the player directly. That'll do. Okay, so what will we call this character? We'll call her Shiga, the Destroyer. No, oh, which is magical. Um. She got flame spin, I don't know, whatever. And uh, yeah, very good. And you can see if the character, that means you can play as this character again. Or that AI could randomly pick this character if that's how you set it up. And uh, done. Okay, so this is the loading screen that you saw on the uh, Elven campaign pop up. I'm gonna leave the video here, guys. It's been long enough, so thank you for bearing with me. Um, the next video will start right here. We'll pick up on all the information you see around the screen, where it is, how to start your initial few turns of one of these games against some harder AI. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll see you there, and uh, thanks for bringing with me for all the troubles. Leave some comments down in the description box, or whatever, and tell me if, uh, if, there's, if I've done anything wrong, or if uh, I need to change volumes, or whatever. And if there's anything you want to see, in the upcoming videos, anything in the menu that I think needs heavily explained, let me know. Uh, yep, yeah. so I'll see you guys soon uh, in the next uh, Let's Play video.